Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. And his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. And his mercy endureth forever. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. And King of Kings. And King of Kings. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading today is going to be Psalms 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, or he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To, who, to him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. Scripture reading today was Psalms, verses 1 through 5. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and doing of his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everybody on the phone line and also on the internet. We're glad you're with us, especially glad since we weren't on the internet last week. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. So we were trying to uh, upgrade the internet and had a snafu. That's a word, look it up. <laughs> had a snafu and, because uh, we're trying to get, get it where we can get people that got iPods and iPads and all of that. I don't know if that was the exact reason, but we had a problem, needless to say, because we heard from a lot of people about it. And, uh, but we back up and running, so it's still to be a few more weeks before we get to get done what we're trying to get done. But we're doing all of this because we know the mission is spreading the gospel all over. As far as wide and wide as we can do it, because the Lord intends for it to be spread all over the world. So whether we do it, it's going to get done, but we're going to do our part. That's why we set up here. And that's a great part of it because we hear from so many people just simply by via the internet. So uh, we glad to be back online. We had some other problems, but it's like, like uh, if the Lord can let Satan stop Gabriel from giving Daniel a message, we know he can stop us from time to time. But overall, Hey, don't nothing get, get lost because even after with all what happened last week, we back online now, and that's what's important. So we're going to get into tonight's lesson, and it just goes to show you that of all that we deal with out of the Bible, and as great as man is, period, and as big and strong as man is, it goes to show you something very little can get you in a world of trouble. And that is your mouth or, or your tongue. So it's been a little over a year since I did a lesson along these lines. The last time I did it, it was titled, Shh, Be Quiet. And because uh, the sister was telling me she got shushed. So that gave me the idea for that title. So this, this is basically the same lesson, it's just with a different title, some different scriptures, but basically the same lesson. And the title is, Death and Life Are in the Tongue. Death and Life Are in the Tongue. And that is saying a whole lot. Just in the tongue. We ain't talking about in the gun, 
in the bomb, in the knife, even in somebody choking somebody with their hands, you don't have to do none of that to destroy. Just your mouth can do it. And the number one person that your mouth will destroy will be you. Because ultimately, that's who's going to pay for it. You might get somebody in a little trouble, get somebody jammed by running your mouth now, but ultimately you're going to pay the price for it. It's going to destroy you. That's why it's so important. It's just like the Lord say, he that diggeth a pit shall fall in it himself. You know, they old folks had a, had a saying that, you know, if you go digging pits, digging ditches, you know, because that's what, that's what people talk about trying to get somebody or do something to somebody, dig a ditch for them so they can fall in the ditch. Well, they had a saying that when you go digging ditches, dig two. Because you think you're just digging one for your enemy or somebody you're trying to get to fall in it. But really, you need one for you. But really, the Bible don't say dig two. That was an old saying that people came up with, dig two. The Bible said, no, nah, only thing you got to do is dig one. Because the one you digging for somebody else, that's the one you're going to be in. And they're going to sidestep it. So, but that's what the Bible said. He that diggeth a pit shall fall in it himself. And you can do all of that just with the tongue. So that's the title. Death and life are in the tongue. That's, this is a direct quote from the Bible. And we're going to read it starting in Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. Well, we're just talking about some words, brothers and sisters, that makes a world of difference. Some words. You see people... Nothing has happened, but people will get in fights. People will kill one another over some words being said. People do that. Ain't nothing. Nobody, nobody haven't actually did anything to anybody yet. It's just some words that they didn't like that was said or some words that shouldn't have been said. And people die over it. So that's an example of what this scripture is saying in and of itself, we all had heard of that. From an individual, on an individual level, or even on a world level. Nations fight one another. They start to fight over not just some actions, but some words. Somebody say this, and then somebody reciprocate and say something else. Now the fight is about to get started. Death and life are in the tongue. Proverbs 18, read that one verse, verse 21. Go ahead. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. See, we didn't take the whole quote, but we just gave you the gist of it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So the tongue has the power to speak death or life. One or the other. And again, the one that's really is talking about, ultimately is talking about the person who's using the tongue themselves. Like I said, you can get some, somebody can lie on somebody and they can send somebody to the gas chamber or to the needle by lying on them. But hey, they just destroyed themselves. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit there. See, they that love to use their tongue the wrong way, they're going to end up paying for it. That's what he's letting you know. That's why all kind of scriptures letting you know about watching your mouth. Proverbs 13. Just back up a few chapters. See, and that's why we preaching. Because preaching, the Lord that made preaching of utmost importance, and we are using the tongue. But what we are preaching is set up to give people life and get people away from death. So even that's another example. That's why we're going around doing all these preach. 
all this preaching. Look, if it was up to me, I can just stay home, brother and sister. I can stay home and have a much more peaceful existence. But we know the importance of what the Lord has set up. We know the importance of going out preaching the gospel because we preaching to people with some words out of the Bible so they can get life. That's why I say in John the sixth chapter, Jesus asked his disciples, a lot of them had left, stopped following him because they didn't understand some of the things he said. They got disenchanted with Jesus. And Jesus asked the 12 disciples, will you leave also? And, and Peter said, where are we going to go? You got the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. All coming from the mouth with preaching. Proverbs 13 and one verse again, verse 3. Go ahead. A man shall not be established by wickedness. Proverbs 13 and verse 3. Go ahead. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. Notice that. Again, that's the title. Death and life are in the tongue. And it's telling you that. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. That's why the first scripture read, it said death and life in the power of the tongue. And he that loveth it shall eat the fruit there. You know, you just love to talk always saying things you shouldn't be saying. You love to do that. He said it's going to be a price for that. You're going to eat the fruit of that, he said. So, on the other hand, he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. What do you mean keep his mouth? He's talking about controlling it. And that's not always easy, is it? Even, you don't even have to be intending, brother. So you don't have to be intending to say something wrong or out of the way. That tongue can sneak up on you. You wake up in the morning, you wasn't intending to curse nobody out. But they said something wrong that you didn't like. You got on a phone conversation trying to straighten out a bill. And you couldn't get the right results. You ready to curse somebody out. And we'll do it in a minute. Just with your mouth, you didn't got in trouble. That shows you how easy it is to sin. You ain't got to actually go and do nothing. Just start talking the wrong way. You didn't got in trouble already. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. That's a big statement. Go ahead. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. And that's an even bigger statement as far as I'm concerned. Because it's a flip side to everything. Either you watch what you say and you can get life. Or you just say what you want to say. You know, some people even say, I can, it's my mouth. I say what I want to say. My mouth. These are my lips. Well, he got something for them too, don't he? He that opened wide his lips shall have what? Shall have destruction. Shall have destruction. We just talking about talking, brother. So we ain't talking about nothing else. You ain't did nothing. You ain't even hit nobody yet. You ain't did nothing to nobody except open wide your lips on them. He that opened wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 12. Back up one chapter. Back up one chapter chapter. This is real basic and this is amazing too because we got people that think you don't have to do nothing. You don't have no rules or regulations to follow and you got so many rules it's not funny even when it comes to what you talking about, what you saying. You got to watch it. Let alone what you're doing. The Lord tells them you got to keep your mouth. Keep that in check. And this didn't change in the New Testament. You know, that's what people want to write everything off. That was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, all we got to do is love. Look, if you love, you're going to be following this. You're going to be keeping the law, period. Old Testament and New Testament tell you the same thing. When we go to the New Testament, we're going to see the same thing. You need to watch your mouth. Because death and life are in the tongue. 12, one verse, verse 18. Go ahead. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, mm -hmm. but the tongue of the wise is health. See, it's one or the other. It can be one or the other. That's why the title is Death and Life are in the tongue, one or the other. 
you're going to be using it right. That's why when you see somebody that's on the quiet side, hey, that's one thing they, they keep it in check. They might be crazy as all get out. They might be committing all kind of sins, but that's one thing that they got in check. So he said, there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. See, again, you don't have to do nothing. You don't have to get no knife and cut nobody. You don't have to get no gun and shoot nobody. You know, that's the commandment. said, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. You don't have to steal nothing from nobody to get yourself in trouble. This shows you how easy it is to sin. All you got to do is open your mouth the wrong way. And you can do much damage here and now, but the real damage is going to come for you when you pay for it. That's the real damage. So we got the choice. We can destroy ourselves with our mouth. Or we can save ourselves and get life with our mouth. That's something very important that we have to keep our eye on. He said, there's that speaketh. Just speaking. Like the piercings of a sword. He says, it's just like you might as well get a knife and cut somebody's head off. The way you run your mouth. You might as well get a knife and cut their head off. And that's probably how a lot of times people that's running their mouth on somebody and got always got something to say about somebody. It's never nothing to say about them. That's probably how they feel. They probably would like to cut somebody's head off, but they might be too scared to do that. So they just cut it off with their mouth. See, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the hidden thing about the tongue. You could, the tongue can kind of maneuver in places where you might be scared to go yourself. But the tongue can, can maneuver in those same areas. That's why the tongue is so deceptive, and that's why it don't seem like it's getting you in as much trouble as it's getting you in because you ain't went nowhere and did nothing. You be sitting on your couch all day long committing all kinds of sins with your mouth. There is that speaking like the piercings of a sword, he said. But on the other hand, what's the rest of that 18th verse? But the tongue of the wise is health. But on the other hand, the tongue of the wise, somebody that got some wisdom, hey, that's health. Mm -hmm. They're going to know how to bring health. They're going to know how to heal. They will know how to bring life. That's what the first scripture said. Death, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let's look at an example. See, sometimes it's just unnecessary, too. 1 Samuel, the uh, 31st chapter. We say things with our mouth that's unnecessary. When I was, when I was real little, real little, started real young, just lying for no reason. This didn't make no sense. Matter of fact, this brother who I know he live in Arkansas now. He texted me the other day. He called me by a nickname that I had, T. Lie. He reminded me. T. Lie. And he could lie good himself, too. I don't know why he's still trying to make fun of me. But uh, that's what we would say. Even about him, we just say he just make up a lie for nothing. Bragging about something that wasn't even true. Well, here's an example right here. 1 Samuel 31. 1 Samuel, the 31st chapter. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Samuel 31. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Okay, go ahead. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. See, the Philistines was beating Israel down because the Lord was upset with Israel. That's the only time Israel would lose when the Lord wasn't with them. He got mad at them for disobedience. This was when Saul was still the king right here. David was about to become king. He was out there fighting them as well. 
where David was successful when he was fighting the Philistines. Right now, Saul is, is being unsuccessful. So that's why I said the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Verse 2. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his son. Uh-huh. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's son. See, see, all of Saul's sons got killed. Even Jonathan, who was a righteous brother, but hey, he ended up, he's still with his father, the Lord, and then, then turned away from his father. And he had already showed favor to David. So he showed how righteous he was, but he stuck with his old man, and they end up dying together. Go ahead, verse 3. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. So now Saul, he got wounded of the, of the, 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 the archers, those that shooting. See, they ain't had no guns or nothing, but they still had something to shoot at you with. Shooting them arrows. Go ahead. Verse 4. four. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, mm -hmm. lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, uh -huh. and abuse me. Uh -huh. But his armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. See, now, this is how Saul died according to the Bible. Saul got injured, and he told his armor bearer, who was right there with him, he said, look, kill me before they come get cap capture me like they did uh, Samson. Same Philistines, Samson had made the Lord mad, and he let Delilah cut his hair, and those same Philistines got him and they abused him big time. Matter of fact, they made sport. They kept him. They didn't want to kill him. They wanted to make sport of him on a regular basis. So they kept him in a cave, kept him in prison, Every now and then, they make him come out and do a little dance for him. Do one of them, do one of them Negro spirituals. Every now and then, they would do that to Samson. Until finally, what they didn't know, the Lord wasn't done with him, period. The Lord was mad with him. Let him out. They put his eyes out and everything. Did him bad because he was putting a hurting on the Philistines. Mm -hmm. But then, the Lord let his hair start growing back and... They was making sport one day. Samson brought the whole building down. He prayed for some more strength. He said, one more time, Lord, give me some strength. He brought the whole cathedral down on them. And all of them died. He died too. But the Bible said he had killed a whole lot of Philistines while he was living. But the Bible said he killed more when he died than all the time he was living. He had all the chief ones up in there watching him make. But that showed you how they did. They was making sport of him. And that's what... Uh, Saul didn't want. So after he got injured, he told his armor bear, draw your sword. And he told his armor bear to kill him. He said, thrust me through, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. You know, he said, no, nah, I don't care what you say. You the Lord's anointed. I can't get away with that. He told him to do it and he wouldn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. He said, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. So what did Saul do? Basically, Saul committed suicide, right? He probably was going to die anyway, but therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He took his own life, didn't he? Verse 5. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Okay, so now his armor bearer died as well. Once he saw Saul was dead, he fell upon his own sword, and he died. Verse 6. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men, that same day together. See, the, a lot of Israelites died that same day together. But you say, what this got to do with? We talking about the tongue. Well, we're going to see somebody, by this incident, for no reason, they're going to make up another story. See, you go to making up stories trying to appeal to somebody, you don't know what kind of trouble you be getting yourself in. That's why it's unnecessary to be trying to look good and tell a story for somebody. Go to 2 Samuel. We right here, just the next chapter, 2 Samuel, the first chapter, and verse 1, because it's going to continue to flow. The report is getting back to David. 
See, and everybody thought David hated Saul because he was on the run from Saul. Saul was trying to kill him, but David didn't hate Saul. David didn't have nothing against Saul. But everybody mistook that. They thought that David was, Saul was David's enemy. Saul wasn't David's enemy. David respected Saul. But somebody was thinking the wrong way. Six, uh, one and one. Second Samuel one and one. Go ahead. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziglag. Uh-huh. It came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Uh -huh. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. Mm -hmm. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. See, now David is finding out what we read already in the previous chapter. David is finding out that they all, they had a bad, they had a bad day and all of them died. Saul, his sons, but we saw exactly how Saul died over there. David, he working for the Lord. He on missions for the Lord. He coming back successful with his missions. He came back successful here against the Amalekites. And he got the news about Saul and Jonathan. Verse 5. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? Uh -huh. And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, mm -hmm. Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. See, now he didn't insert himself in the story. He wasn't. This didn't happen the way he's saying it. He is lying with his mouth. He using his tongue and he think that he is going to get a blessing for this. See, he probably heard the story. You know, it's just like somebody, they get around some, they, they been around some famous people, then they start dropping names to somebody else. Oh yeah, I know so-and-so, so-and-so. I know them. You don't know them. You, you might have heard somebody else talking about him, but you don't know him. Never met him. Heard somebody else say they know him and told you about them being, this the same type of thing. But he didn't insert himself. He probably heard the story. He knew where it happened at. Matter of fact, he showed up on the scene a little late though. So this young man says, I happened by chance upon Mount Gibboa, which is where it was. And behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. Oh, that's true, because he heard the story. He got the story from somebody. Verse 7. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, mm -hmm. and called unto me, and I answered, here am I. Here am I. See, now he didn't put himself in the story. This didn't happen this way. Go ahead. And he said unto me, who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Uh -huh. He told him. He said, I'm an Amalekite, because that's what he was. But this didn't happen this way. We just saw what happened with Saul. This conversation took place between, what's getting ready to happen, took place between Saul and his armor bearer. Go ahead. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me. For anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. See? So that's what Saul said. But Saul said, he didn't say that to a stranger. He said that to his own armor bearer. And his armor bearer was too scared to do it. His armor bearer said, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. I can't get away if I do that. Go ahead. So I stood upon him uh -huh. and slew him. See, he, he straight up lying. For no reason. Well, he think. He got a reason in his own mind. He think David is going to give him a war. He didn't have to go through all of this, though. All the man had to do is come back and tell the truth, tell what happened. It's unnecessary. It's just lying unnecessary. Just like people boasting about they didn't done something. That's why the Bible said he that boasted of a false gift is foolishness. So now he boasting like he didn't did something that he didn't do with his mouth. 
So he, he told the story, like I said, he had to hear the story. It's just like somebody had to hear the story because we reading all this story, right? Somebody got the story and knew the story because we able to read about what really happened with Saul and how he died with his armor bearer there. And now we got a false one here where this guy knew, but he, he didn't insert himself in the story. He said at verse 10, so I stood upon him and I slew him. He don't testify that he slew the man, Saul. He testified that he slew Saul, which he actually didn't. Saul slew himself. But he, he hedged it a little bit because he didn't want to look like he was just bogus. So he said, because I was sure he could not live. So I did him a favor. It was a mercy killing. I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Go ahead, finish that. And I took the crown that was upon his head. See, evidently he didn't been by the scene and he do got the crown and he didn't heard the story. Because he do got the crown. Go ahead. And the bracelet that was on his arm. See, that's what he think he getting ready to get paid for. He said, I got the crown and I got the bracelet. Go ahead. And I brought them hither unto my Lord. Uh-huh. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them. Mm -hmm. And likewise all the men that were with him. See, now David went into a state of mourning immediately. See, because a lot of people thought David was against Saul. They wasn't against Saul. David didn't have nothing against Saul. Matter of fact, David still loved Saul. So David took all his clothes and rent them. Likewise, all the men that were with him, and what did they do? Verse 12. And they mourned and wept and fasted until eve. They mourned and wept and fasted because they just found out Israel has suffered a great loss. That's whose side David is on. He's on Israel's side. He's fighting wars for Israel. Was fighting wars for Israel under Saul until things got out of hand. So it said, then David took hold of his clothes and rent them likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fast until evening. For who? For Saul and uh, for Jonathan his son. Uh -huh. And for the people of the Lord. Uh -huh. And for the house of Israel. Uh -huh. Because they were fallen by the sword. See, because they were fallen by the sword. They didn't want that to happen. So they were, went into a state of mourning. But now he went through that. He didn't even deal with the, the guy that came and told him the story. He went, he went into a state of mourning. Then when he come out of that, he going to address the situation. Verse 13. And David said unto the young man that told him, when art thou? And so he said, now where you from again? Tell me where you from. Go ahead. And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. See, he had already told that in the story. So I guess David wanted some confirmation. Where you, who are you? I'm a son of a stranger and a Malachite. That's who David had actually just went to war with. But this man would not have got killed, because he's getting ready to die, if he had not <laughs> used his tongue the wrong way. He wouldn't have got killed. He just made up a, 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 a lie needlessly, thinking he's going to get a reward. He got a reward, okay, verse 14. And David said unto him, how was thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointing? He said, well, look, man, let me ask you something. How was you not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointing? You know, this had to be a bad day for this dude. <laughs> this was a bad day. He go make up a story thinking he going to get paid for it. And all of a sudden, the tables and turned. And he about to get his head taken off for it. That wasn't a good day for him. And he didn't even do it. He didn't do it. But his tongue got him in trouble. See, David was on the run from Saul. He had a couple of opportunities to kill Saul, and he refused to kill Saul. Even some people in this camp. You know, Saul trying to kill him. He refused to kill Saul. People in this camp said, this is your chance. You can take his head off now. You can kill him. He said, man, I can't stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointing and be innocent. And he, so he wouldn't do it. Show you how much respect they had. The armor bearer wouldn't do it, right? He told this. Saul told his armor bearer, look, man, kill me before they come and abuse me. 
The armor bear said, can't do it. <laughs> you on your own on that one. Kill myself first. I can't do that. Now this guy, <coughs> he going to come and say he did it. So he said, how come you wasn't afraid to stretch forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Verse 15. And David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. See, David called one of the young brothers and said, look, kill him. And this guy died. You know, he probably, you know what, it, probably some of his last words. I was lying. I really didn't kill him. It didn't happen like that. You know he finally tried to come clean. But guess what? Death and life are in the tongue. Hey, you didn't lie and say you didn't kill the man. You're going to pay for it just like you didn't kill him. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to believe now. <laughs> so David called one of the young men and said, fall upon him. And he smote him and that he died. 16. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head. Uh, he said, look, your blood be on your head. See, David didn't get in no trouble for this. The Lord never said, well, why you killing? You know, he really didn't kill nobody. Look, you, he lied. David said unto him, thy blood be upon thy head. Why is his blood upon his head? For thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. See, your mouth testified against you, saying, I have slain the the Lord said, your own mouth testified. You done made up an elaborate story, and your own mouth done got you in trouble. He probably started coming clean. David said, look, you said you killed him. <laughs> now go to the New Testament, Matthew 16. That's why in, 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 in the smallest, we might not even call ourselves mean and bad when we say certain things. Sometimes you could think you're saying the right thing and it's still wrong. That's why you really got to keep your mouth. You got to guard it. Put a watch on it. Matthew 16. I bet you that guy, when he was on his way to tell that story, he didn't think it was going to end like that. <clears throat> Matthew 16 and verse 21. Now here's one of the Lord's servants, Peter himself, 16 and 21. Go ahead. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes uh -huh. and be killed and be, and be raised again the third day. See, Jesus letting them know how he got to die. He was letting them know, look, we're going to Jerusalem. They're going to mis mis misuse me. <laughs> They're going to abuse me, the religious leaders, elders, scribes, chief priests. And then they're going to kill me, but I'm going to raise again the third day. After three days and three nights in actuality, I'm going to rise again. But Peter didn't mean no harm. What did he say? Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. See, now that's why I said sometimes you don't even have to mean no harm. You think you're saying the right thing, but you're still saying the wrong thing. You're still using your mouth the wrong way. So he going to contradict the Lord. It's just like we can read something out the Bible to people. Read it some. This is in the Bible, and then people will contradict it. People will have a problem with it and speak against it when you can read it right out the Bible. And some of them, they don't even mean nothing evil. They don't mean nothing ill. They don't have no ill will, but it's still ill will just the same, and you're still getting yourself in trouble by speaking against the truth. That's what Peter, Peter is one of the, Lord, one of the Lord's greatest disciples when it was all said and done. He wasn't the Lord's greatest disciples, but... He used his mouth the wrong way this time. Peter took the Lord and rebuked him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be any. Now, he mean well, because he said, I don't, I don't think you, you know, you're the Lord. Why would you, should you have to go through all that? Let them abuse you like that. 
and take advantage of you. That don't seem right, Lord. Far be that from you, that that should happen to you. That seems like, you know, he's on the Lord's side, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he thought. But it was contrary. 20, 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, he, got, he, he wasn't expecting that either, I don't think. Just like that young Amalekite. He thought he was going to get a reward from David, especially because he bought the crown and the bracelet. He thought he was going to, matter of fact, David said later, the cat thought he was going to get a reward. He said it later. He said when he brought me that news, he spoke about that years, some, some time later, years later. He said, yeah, the one that came and told me that Saul and Jonathan was dead, he thought I was going to give him a reward. And I killed him, and that was when he was about to kill somebody else for what they had did. They had killed, uh, they had killed one of Jonathan's sons, some of his servants. They thought they was going to like that. They came and told David, yeah, we killed him. David said, what? You killed him? Okay, you getting ready to die now. They didn't, believe, they didn't think that. Well, it's the same thing here. Peter couldn't have thought that he was about to get called Satan. But that's what Jesus called him. Because it don't matter what his intentions were, he was speaking the wrong way with his tongue. He was using his tongue in error. So that show you again, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can say the right thing and le that leads to life and bring some health to somebody, or you can say the wrong thing that leads to death or bring some ill will to somebody. So 23, he said, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Go ahead. Thou art an offense unto me. You are an offense to me. Go ahead. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, mm -hmm. but those that be of men. See, your, your, your mind is on the wrong thing. See, he knew he, he knew he meant well, but it don't matter what you mean. It matter what the Lord say and where you are in respect to what the Lord is saying. That's what matter. Go to James 3. So we got examples in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, how the tongue, just the tongue, just by you opening your mouth the wrong way can get you in a lot of trouble. Three, and one. James three and one. Go ahead. My brother, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Uh -huh. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. See, letting you know if any man of offend not in word. See, if you can get your mouth together, that's one of the hardest things to get together. If you can get your mouth together, you can get everything else together. That's one of the hardest things to get together. Because you can sin so easily with your mouth. Don't even have to leave the house. Don't even have to leave the block. Don't even have to go nowhere. If any, you can be right in your house, sending up a storm with your mouth. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle, that means put in subjection, put in check the whole body. Go ahead. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths mm -hmm. that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Mm -hmm. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with the very small helm whithersoever the governor listed. So he's showing you how something little can have a great effect on something big. That's why he, he talking about bits in the horse's mouth. He said, we put little bits in the horse's mouth. You know, you had a little harness and you have bits in the horse's mouth and you pull the horse one way or other to make him go which way you want him to go. Big old horse, but you can control him by having something little, like a bit in his mouth. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. 
just by the bit that's in the horse's mouth. Then he gave you another little example. He said he talked about ships and how, you know, if you ever been on a ship, I didn't been on a ship, and even steered a ship for a few miles before I hit something, because it ain't easy as it might look. But the little, there's a big old ship and it's a little bitty steering wheel. Smaller than, some of them smaller than the steering wheel you got in the car. Steering the whole ship. He said, behold also, the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hymn, whithersoever the governor listens. Whichever way you want to go, that's going to control the whole ship. That little thing. Well, he's telling you, the tongue is so little, but it controls big things. We know it controls big things because the title of the lesson is death and life are in the tongue. That lets you know the tongue controls some big stuff. If, it's, if, if death and life, you got the power to get death and life by the tongue. That's a lot of power. Go ahead, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member. See, just like the bit in the horse's mouth, just like the hem of a ship, even so, the tongue is a little member. Go ahead. And boasted the great thing. Oh, it boasts great thing. Like that Amalekite. He boasted that he killed Saul, and he really didn't. He still died for it because of his tongue. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasted great thing. It boasts great thing. Sometimes we think we know more than we know and start boasting stuff. Go ahead. Behold. How great a matter a little kindle, a little fire kindle. See, he said, but how, how great a matter a little fire kindle. See, it don't matter that the tongue is a little member. It can start a great fire. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. And the tongue is a fire. Go ahead. A world of iniquity. A wor all by itself, a world of iniquity. That's why death and life are in the power of it. It's a fire, a world of iniquity. That's something else. You ain't got to leave and go outside and do nothing to nobody physically. You can just run your mouth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So what? So is the tongue among our members. So is the tongue among our members. Go ahead. That it defileth the whole body uh -huh. and set it on fire the course of nature. Uh -huh. And it is set on fire of hell. Wow, that's a whole lot, isn't it? The tongue, that's why you see some people like to talk and just like to say things out of order. Then you see somebody that don't hardly say nothing. Most people that don't have no understanding, they might think the one talking is really one that they, they got more understanding because they always talking, always got something to say about everything. But according to the Lord, the one that's keeping quiet got a better chance. He said in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature. And it's set on fire of hell. Because the, the tongue is going to lead people to hell just by their tongue. You ain't got to do nothing else. The tongue in itself will get you tossed into hell. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Uh -huh. But the tongue can no man tame. Uh -huh. It is an unruly evil uh -huh. full of deadly poison. Wow. Go ahead. There with... Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. See, that shouldn't be. You're going to bless God and praise God and bless him, then you're going to curse man who is made in the image of God, the Bible tell you. It shouldn't be that way. Go ahead. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brother. These things are not so to be. See, it's not, it shouldn't be. 
Go ahead. Doth the fountain send forth the same place, sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain bo both yield salt water and fresh. See, you got to make up your mind which side of the fence you're going to be on with the tongue. Either you're going to speak the right things and then be quiet when there ain't nothing else to say, or you're going to speak the right thing sometime, then use your tongue out of order, disorderly, then you're going to pay for it. Flip over to the fourth chapter. 4 and 13. 4 and 13. Go ahead. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. See, now this is just, it seemed like just some idle conversation, but he warning you how you got to be careful with your tongue. You ain't really got to be cursing nobody out saying the wrong thing to get in trouble with your tongue either. We saw that as an example with that Amalekite in, in Samuel. He didn't, he didn't curse nobody out. He didn't really get upset and say the wrong thing or start blaspheming God. He just boasted of something that wasn't even true. He might as well have killed Saul because he died like he killed him. But he hadn't done nothing. He just said it with his mouth. So that's an example how you boasting Something that's not true. That's why the Bible even speaks about boasting. Boasting great things. You know, Peter, he got out of his league, going to tell Jesus. That wasn't, that wasn't going to happen to Jesus. After Jesus told him, I'm getting ready to go up to Jerusalem and die. Oh, far be that from you. He got out of his league. He thought he knew more than he did. He said, now go to ye that say today or tomorrow. We would go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gas. You know, even just boasting about the future like you got the power to control it one way or another. He's going to tell you how you should look at things and speak things with your mouth. Speak about it with your mouth. Go ahead, 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Now that don't seem like no big thing, you know, but if you don't have the right mentality, if you're not acknowledging that God is in control of everything, you might do tomorrow. And you just speaking like you got control over tomorrow, you out of line just by that. Just by something simple like that. Oh, we're going to do such and such. That's why a lot of times we preference, preference things that we're trying to do around here for the Lord. You know, we always say, what are you going to say here? If it be the Lord's will. If it be the Lord's will, we'll do that. Go ahead. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a, le for a little time and then vanished the way. So he said, you ain't got no control at all. Your life is a vapor. We get carried away thinking we more than we are. He said, what is your life? It is even a vapor. That's how all our life is. The oldest one around, life is a vapor. It appeared for a little time and Vanish away. 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. See, that's what you ought to say. And even if you don't say it all the time, that should be understood. You should understand that. Because you don't have no power to do, do nothing one way or another. He said, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. But go ahead. But now you rejoice in your boastings. Mm -hmm. All such rejoicing is evil. See, he said you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Go ahead. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, that's good. Back up to James 1 now. James 1. So it's all kind of ways you can get in trouble with your mouth, with the tongue. And I'm talking about destroy yourself. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We've seen examples of it. James 1 and 19. Here's some more. Go ahead. Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. See, now that, that, should, that should be real clear about 
the things that we've read so far in this lesson. That it's good to be slow to speak. It's not talk too fast or talk too much. It's good. We should see that clearly. Because the less you open your mouth, the less chances you have of getting yourself in trouble that way with your tongue. You, you still got other stuff you got to worry about and keep your eyes on and make sure you don't do. But the tongue is so easy to get you in trouble. You really need to get out in front of that. How do you do it? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Sometimes we cannot hear because we too busy speaking. We too busy trying to talk. Even if you're not talking, you ain't listening to what the other person's saying sometime because you're sitting there thinking about what you're going to say. I'm going to say so-and-so, so-and-so. And, so. and then they've been said, did you hear me? You said, no, not really, because you was thinking. Even little simple things. Why do this happen all the time? Somebody introduce themselves to you. You meet somebody for the first time. And y'all introduce yourselves to one another. And five minutes later, you can't even remember their name. You be like, what's your name again? Why is that? Because you weren't listening. And you wasn't paying no attention to it. And you probably was thinking about saying something or what I'm going to say. But you wasn't really focusing on but he said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to wrath, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, because that's the easiest way the tongue gets you in trouble, too. You call yourself getting upset, and you're going to get mad and say something that you shouldn't say with your tongue. That's why he says, slow to speak and slow to wrath. Verse 20, go ahead. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh-uh. Sometimes we try to bring some wrath thinking we righteous, but the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Skip down to verse 26 and go ahead. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. See, you could be in the church, but if you don't bridle your tongue, you, he said you deceive your own heart. You could be in the church. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridle, that means that mean put it in subjection, put it in check, bridle of not his tongue but deceive his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction mm -hmm. and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's good. Now back up and we're going to read 19 one more time because... That needs to be noted. Go ahead. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to speak and slow to wrath. Now, this is the New Testament. Show you just how all this go together. Go back to the Old Testament. Back to Proverbs 17 this time. Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17. We got a couple of verses, 27 and 28. See, this is real basic, but it's some of utmost importance. Even though it should be simple, obviously it ain't that simple because we got all these scriptures letting you know to be to watch out. Be careful how you run your mouth. 17 and 27. Proverbs 17 and 27. Okay, go ahead. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, mm -hmm. and a man of understanding is, is of an excellent spirit. See, he that hath knowledge. See, somebody might think you stupid if you not talking a whole lot. They, they might think, you know, everybody else talking, everybody else putting their two cent in, and you just standing back not saying nothing. Somebody that's running their mouth think, oh, they don't know nothing. That's why they're not saying nothing. But no, he that hath knowledge spareth his words. Spare his words. That's what we just read. You see, we just left James in the New Testament. He said, let every man be 
quick to hear, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. Slow to speak. Well, he that have knowledge spareth his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Now this is what, what else he say? 28.